right, uh, we are live. Love saying that. Um, so, welcome to another um, episode of uh, our Arctic Backstage uh, Past event. Um, so excited to, uh, to do another one of these. Um, we've got a, a very awesome crew with us today, and um, like I said, this is our fourth one, and we're kind of moving up the stack. Is the idea, and um, we're excited to do this one. Um, I think the original conversation was maybe this is like an Anthos and Friends event, but we landed on Anthos and the tools you love. So um, today we're going to um, dive in a little deeper into some of the ecosystem tooling and, you know, a lot of these projects have open source roots and um, we're, we're seeing them in a lot of our customers. So it's been pretty great to be able to, to uh, dig into the weeds of these toolkits and be able to think about integrations. Um, uh, one of the things we do see is, you know, customers need more than just one vendor to provide tooling, obviously, and we're doing a lot of work in the Antho space, but um, we're also doing a lot of work with our ecosystem and CNCF and open source. So we're going to dive into a couple of partners that we know and love here today. So we're going to talk, uh, um, talk about some of the tech around HashiCorp and some of the security capabilities around that. Obviously, HashiCorp has a pretty... Um, big tool stack now, um, and we use a whole lot of it. We're going to uh, dig into some stuff around our friends over at Sysdig, talk about uh, what their tools can do and how they can kind of complement your stack. And we've been doing an enormous amount of work with GitLab lately, um, especially in the CICD space. So um, dig into some of the capabilities um, that are possible with GitLab. Um, I think you'll see with all of these tools, they probably have root with one kind of problem they solved and then they certainly grew out of that and added a lot more capabilities. So we are here to kind of share the knowledge on that. Um, go over the agenda maybe quickly and uh, I'll do a quick tee up and then we'll get to the fun stuff, get over to the demos. You know, our events are very heavy live demo and that's no different today. Um, so I'll give a quick intro just to catch people up on what we're doing with Anthos and GCP and Google Cloud. Um, I'm your host, Kyle. Al Bassett. I have a pretty awesome team. As I said, I got Paul Shea and Merrick here with me. Um, we are watching for chats in the live stream. So if you have questions or comments, um, shout them out. We'll try to keep an eye on that and, and keep things pretty free flowing. We have an awesome special guest today, uh, Seth Vargo. I'm sure lots of people have heard of Seth. So he's going to pop in a little bit later and we're going to have an open style kind of fireside chat with him. So if you have questions for Seth, um, throw them in the channel and we'll make sure that we we bring those up. And uh, yeah, like I said, engage in the chat. And I love saying like and subscribe. My kids love that line. We just, uh, it's good to have good followers and we're gonna keep doing these events. So we wanna be able to kind of share that knowledge. Um, all right, let's let's uh, let's keep rolling. Um, so, what I'll uh, I kind of mentioned this is our fourth event, and uh, I want to thank our wonderful artists who build uh, build um, some of these wicked posters that we're able to share. So this is the fourth one. Um, we have some more events coming. We'll probably start to sway from the Anthos topic a little bit, and then we'll come back to it in various uh, various scenarios to be able to kind of share that knowledge. Um, but this one's really about other tools and some of the complementary tools that you're able to kind of uh, integrate um, into the stack. So quick thing about Anthos, um, just setting up the different components. We've talked through a lot of these recently. Um, Arctic's been very fortunate to be able to work with Google as a design partner on a lot of these kind of core components. And like I said, it brings us to work with other ecosystem partners. So we like to be at the tip of the spear and be able to learn these tools and develop opinions so we can kind of help our customers. So today, these tools integrate with a lot of these areas, but this is kind of our, our main kind of starship of Anthos managing all of these. And then the reality is we come to customers and they have tools implemented already that we need to integrate with, or they're looking for recommendations on, on more tools. So. If we look at the Antho stack, you'll see on the left, there's a lot about config management and policy management. And, you know, uh, for example, our, our special guest, Seth, has a long history with Chef and things config management. And I'd say we've kind of moved to this GitOps model. Um, to the far right is really operational tools. And I think that's what you're going to see um, some of the things we talk about today with security and, and automation. And then obviously developer experience and pipelines are, are important. So GitLab will start to come into that conversation. Um, and you, as we build more of these series, you're going to see us kind of bring more tools and more stories into, into play here. 
So without wasting um, too much time, I just want to, this is a diagram I used recently for a, a JFrog talk I did. And back to my point around, you know, one platform doesn't solve all problems. You'll see a lot of different um, vendors and ISVs and open source solutions on this. And it is sometimes a, a mix and match puzzle game of being able to implement new tools and, and use the ones you have. Um, we've developed a lot of opinions on this and, um, a lot of the workflow and things like that are centering around uh, GitLab and a lot of projects we're working and, you know, GitLab solved a lot of these. There's other players in the space, but today we're going to double down on GitLab and um, just show kind of, you know, the art of the possible. That's the, the kind of goal of this. Um, so, you know, if you have an opinion or you have a question, stay engaged and, and shoot us a, a message. All right, let's get to the speakers. So um, I think uh, Merrick is up first is the plan. Um, and he's going to dive in and talk about HashiCorp Vault and Anthos. So I'm going to throw it over to you, Merrick. I'll pull your screen up. And uh, can, uh, without further stay. ado, let's uh, let's get to. Yeah, we can stay on the slides for a while. And Sorry, what was that, Merrick? Before we jump into the demo, we can stay okay. with the slides. All right, perfect. Yep. Yeah. So hi everyone. My name is Merrick Anderson. I'm a consultant at Arctic and work on automation vault and Anthos. And my talk will focus on onboarding Vault to Anthos, Dynamic Secrets, and Root Credential Rotation. Um, Kyle mentioned that earlier. Um, we also like to think about um, of this talk um, as Anthos and friends. So I guess the unofficial title here is A Tale of Two Friends. So with that, let me put on my reading glasses and read you a little tale of two friends. Once upon a time, when Vault was very young, it didn't feel at home within containers. As time went on, so did Vault's maturity. Containers became as much a home for Vault as virtual machines were. Then, Vault and Anthos met one another. They smiled at each other and simultaneously said, I want to be friends with you. Vault added, and I'm really good at keeping secrets. Anthos replied, and I have a neatly managed, highly available home for you. I can manage your resources. To which Walt replied, Amazeballs, let us begin right now. So that was awesome. <laughs> I, I love first on these backstage uh, events. I think we had a first last time, and that's the first story time with Anthos and Vault we've had. So I look forward to challenging other team members. That was wicked. Thank you, Mark. So, with that, a, a quick agenda for, for my part here. Um, Kyle mentioned that in our first backstage pass event back in, in May. Uh, Tim Fairweather showed us how managing resources in our cluster is simplified with Anthos config management. Today, I will let Anthos config management deploy HashiCorp Vault into my cluster. And this is really where Anthos and Vault's friendship starts. Then we briefly recap how Vault can issue and revoke dynamic secrets, database secrets with PostgreSQL. And lastly, we will let Vault handle the rotation of our database root credentials. And without further ado, it's demo time. All right. So let's flip over to my shared screen. Perfect. So I had a lot of power outages and internet problems. So this is all pre-recorded, but here we go. So in, in previous events, we have demonstrated to manage and control resources in our cluster with Anthos Config Management, or in short, ACM. So let's apply the same to HashiCorp Vault. I prepared the Helm templated manifests in a directory, and I'm about to copy that directory into my Git repository. Remember that Anthos Config Management is based on a Git repository that is pulled into our cluster. So I'm copying over all of these manifests into my Git repository. Then we will push them to Git in a second. Before we do that, remember that we can briefly do a quick test on our manifest with a nomos vet command, which is part of the ACM suite. So after I verify that everything is in order, we can move ahead do our commit and our push to git and wait for everything to reconcile on the ACM side in our cluster. All right. 
So once we pushed and ACM is aware of the latest commit that we did, it's a good idea to use the normal status command, which is really the live and important check to see whether everything is in order or not. So let's take a look. All right, it's showing that it's synced to the latest uh, git commit that we just did. So that is looking good. Everything is healthy. It's up to date on our master branch. So now that the vault is deployed, we still have to initialize vault. And here in this example, I'm using the GCP KMS for auto unseal with vault. That's why we have the parameters recovery shares and recovery threshold. Okay. Now I'm adding the other two pods. We have three pods in this deployment. And if I provide all parameters, this will work. I'm adding the second pod to the, my raft cluster. And then finally, the third vault pod as well, to the raft cluster. So now at this point, the cluster is complete and um, it's in an unsealed state. So let's take a look at the web interface. So that's up, that's good. Let's try to log in with our root to token that we just got. And I have to make sure to copy the correct one. All right, so far so good. Vault is up. It's deployed with ACM to our cluster. So that's a really great start. So let's move on to dynamic database secrets with PostgreSQL. And Merrick, do you want to maybe just talk about what the what what seal and unseal is for people who aren't, aren't familiar with that when we say the yeah the sure seal. so when we when we think about vault and like vault I love the term it's a really great metaphor it's a really good, great mental image the vault at first is uninitialized there's no content nothing in it so before doing anything we have to initialize Vault to set up the encryption keys. And then once we've done that, if you think about a bank vault, it's still closed. We have to unseal it. We have to provide the codes, if you will, to open the vault and be able to access it, to write secrets to it or read secrets from it. And the best way in a production environment to do that is to use auto unseal. And for that, you can use, for example, cloud providers, KMS, to automatically unseal vault. That's especially important if for any reason whatsoever, your vault pod needs to restart or it crashes and therefore it needs to restart. Whenever that happens, vault would remain in that case in a sealed state. And the alternative to this automatic unseal is of course the manual unseal, but that's really not feasible in a production environment. So you would have to go in and issue multiple commands, maybe separated between different people to get vault unsealed. So for this demo, I just used one key share, but in a production environment, you would have, let's say the typical scenario would be you have five key shares of which at least three have to be provided to unseal vault. And those will most likely be separated between different people. So the manual process is really unfeasible in a production environment, but that it's supposed to be highly available at all times. Right. Okay, cool. Yeah, it goes back to that principle of, you know, if we're going to run workloads in Kubernetes, we should be able to withstand pod restarts and node failures and stuff without having to call operations teams. So that's a, that's a good point. Thanks for that. Yeah, for sure. So he, here for the dynamic database secrets with PostgreSQL, we will first enable the Kubernetes authentication and set it up to communicate with my cluster. For that, we have to specify the vault auth service account the service accounts JWT, which is used to access the token review API and the PAM encoded CA cert to talk to the Kubernetes API. Once that is established, we can specify a role. Sorry, yeah, Kubernetes was already enabled. Um, so once um, we have that established, we can specify a role that will allow Postgres to generate dynamic secrets for us. 
And this role will get a vault policy assigned later on that includes the appropriate vault capabilities to read the dynamic database secrets. So from a vault perspective, it's really a read operation since we are reading from a pad inside of vault. Alongside vault here in the cluster, we provision a minimal Postgres instance and create the required Postgres role. So inside of Postgres, that allows us to create further Postgres roles. So for that, let's forward the traffic to our Postgres servers. Oh, I already had it set up. So I have to cancel that, set up a new forward here. So now we, that we can talk to our Postgres service, let's import some sample data, set the Postgres role, and define the user for Vault to be used. So I'm just importing some world cities and, and countries, like a small database. Then we log in again to Postgres and set up our vault user. OK, I already prepared that as well to provide a password for that user, which we will provide to vault. So that's how vault will be able to talk to the Postgres database. So now that all of that is set up, we will enable Vault's database secrets engine and configure it with a template connection string for communication with Postgres. Again, I already enabled the secrets engine here prior to the demo. And um, in the configuration, note that the username and password are on extra lines here. So this is the templated part. If we wouldn't do that on the connection URL line. We could provide the clear text username and password. But what this does, how I'm doing it right now, is if at a later point in time a different vault administrator is reading this information, he cannot gain the clear text username and password. So this way, in the templated form, this information remains protected. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, we have to write the policy to Vault for Postgres and to retrieve the dynamic database secret with a default TTL of five minutes. Can be extended to a maximum of 12 hours in this case. And then the username has a prefix with v root read only, which is the information tying back to Vault. So it's saying this comes from Vault and it's coming from a read only policy inside of Vault. And we have a generated suffix to the username and the randomly generated password. So an extended demo of all of this, how to set up Vault and PostgreSQL to handle dynamic database secrets, can be found in our main video featuring Tim Fairweather. So in the last part, we will take a look at the rotating of the root credentials. So Naturally, at this point, we all say, wait a minute, there's still a single username and password involved that can create arbitrary Postgres roles. That's what we just did. So let's take a look at my last part. So before we go about rotating the root credentials, let's begin with the initial credentials we supply to Vault. Let's see what the hash value of these credentials looks like at the moment. So we have to make sure that our forwarding is still intact and we log in to Postgres one more time. And we will take a look at the hash value of our Vault user password. So all you need to remember here is the CC65 at the end. So we are just trying to find the difference here. So let's just focus on the last four characters here, CC65. OK, so, so that's that's fine. As long as the target database supports rotating of root credentials, and that's most databases, um, there's a table, a comparison table for, for that. Um, we just have to use an API endpoint to rotate the initial root database credentials. Um, if I'm using the correct uh, name I provided earlier. 
So that's it. That's it. We just rotated the credentials. Um, so keep keep the characters in mind you see at the top, CC64. And now you can see that our vault user has changed. So now it's E77B. So with just one simple call to the vault API, we changed our root credentials for the password, sorry, for the database. So at this point, now that the root credential was rotated, only vault holds the new root password. So there's no way otherwise to see what the clear text password is. So in the production environment, it's probably still a good idea to have a separate super user dedicated um, to worst case scenario um, debugging sessions or something like that. Okay, so now that we did that, let's let's ensure that Vault can still generate dynamic credentials after we rotated the root credentials. And yeah, it's it's still working. We we got another set of username and password dynamically generated. So the simple API call we did to rotate these credentials, that could be invoked on a regular basis. So in conclusion, coming back to my last slide. Each vault needs a home, but it doesn't have to be an island. <laughs> and with that, I hand my virtual microphone back to our host, Kyle Bassett. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks, Mark. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, the, every time we get into a conversation with some of our customers around, <clears throat> I don't know what, I, what I'll call new age secret management, I think the no one's ever argues the compelling nature of being able to, you know, auto rotate and be able to prove compliance on who has what. I mean, we've been passing around SSH keys for a long time once we started this automation. It's usually pretty detrimental to be able to have to go rotate a bunch of things and worry about breaking things in production. I think this this approach is is super powerful and I mean, the hardest part is change, right? So having organizations kind of go down this road and start to look at these things differently is is kind of critical to all of this. Um, so I think, you know, demos like that help to show people what's possible and, and then we can start to tighten up our security. And Vault's obviously got a fantastic story around integrations and just making all this stuff kind of easy. And, and you can also start with just open source. Like you can download these tools and start to try them out and work with them before you make like a full commitment to move to support and things like that. So awesome. Thanks for that demo. And I think the plan next is uh, we'll just keep charging forward here. Um, over to Shay Stewart to talk about Sysdig Secure DevOps platform and Anthos. So over to you, Shay. Thank you very much, Kyle. And uh, Merrick, that was an awesome story. Way to set the bar. Um, you know, it, it's funny. I, I almost was trying to find a tweet in my mind right now to talk about friends because you're talking about a tale of two friends. And I think what that brings up for me is the friendship actually between Arctic and Cystic. And um, so I am a partner at Arctic. I like all the things of DevOps. I like talking about security when it um, comes into automation and the tools around that. And how Cystic fits into this was Cystic was actually one of Arctic's, I believe the first partner of Arctic in the ecosystem. And so there's been an immense amount of respect and, and care for the two teams as both companies have grown um, in very complementary ways. And it's a natural fit that over the last while with Arctic's investment in the Google Anthos platform, that the Sysdig toolkit and, and capabilities complements it quite nicely. And uh, because their focus is on container um, visibility and security and, 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 and instrumentation. So I think that there's a, a natural fit. And it, as that friendship has you know, built with us for about the last four years, I'm hoping with the Anthos story that the Sysdig and Anthos story goes um, much longer as well. So that's a little bit about me. Let's talk just again at a high level of the view that I'm taking on Anthos. Um, it is really focused for me on the multi-cloud journey. A lot of the customers that we work with now are not um, focused on working in one particular cloud only and beholden to that cloud's technology stack, which I think Google saw quite easily. And while we're witnessing quite a bit of the workload transformation happening at the Kubernetes or the container layer, um, yes, there are other services that each cloud provider you know, builds that are, that are quite helpful. 
But um, the Kubernetes and container layer allows it to be more portable. And what Google has done really well with Anthos is given you the ability to have a control plane that will manage your Kubernetes clusters across GKE inside of Google data centers, inside of AWS data centers, inside of Microsoft data centers, or if you're actually not running GKE, they can still provide some configuration management and connectivity capability at the um, you know, EKS or AKS kind of layer as well, or OpenShift, um, or on-prem, right, for, for bare metal workloads. And our view of this with the, with the organizations that we work with is that the single control plane, regardless of where the workload lives, is going to make that change management conversation a lot easier, which is where people are struggling today. So how does the Sysdig platform come into this? Well, if Anthos is all about the platform that runs the application, then Sysdig is all about how do we view and secure the application? So they're not going to run it, but they're going to plug into those tools to give you instrumentation that allows you to provide security at the build or, or the registry storage time. Or um, more importantly, they're, they're going to secure their workload that's actually running in production. Um, and provide some level of insight and capability around incident response. And so I think that you know, the Sysdig platform has done a really good job of pivoting from just monitoring to using that same agent into the security realm over the last couple of years. Um, the flow that I think we're all gonna be familiar with, but we'll kind of talk about a few different sections is, you know, when we talk about shift left with security and, and visibility tools, it means as close to the code or the developer as we can, do we wanna start putting these tools in play. And what's important is being able to scan the images that we're building much faster and ahead of time before we release them into production. That way we can catch the issue and not have to do multiple releases to fix a vulnerability. Um, then we also want to be able to validate it that it's compliant once we're in the pre-prod state, again, before we've deployed it to production. But then once it's in production, we also want to make sure that what is in production is still healthy and secure. And if it's vulnerable, we want to be able to take action if some new vulnerability happens to be um, identified. So better together, I, I think the story works really well and you will actually find, you know, Sysdig in the um, Anthos partner ecosystem. There, you know, is a little bit of over overlap on the operational visibility side, but I actually think um, there are reasons where each toolkit exceeds. And, and more often, I think there's a lot that doesn't overlap. So if we talk about Anthos, I mean, they're really focused on the platform and multi-cloud management. I think that's really like if I hammered home that image, I think that that's what people are looking for. Um, you know, almost a single API endpoint to control their workloads no matter where they are. And I believe that view to be very true for the Sysdig visibility and security platform. So Anthos can't actually handle all workloads. They can handle a lot of multi-cloud components and all of your containerized workloads, but it's not really solving the problem around on-prem VMs or things like that that aren't, um, that aren't underneath its management domain. Where Sysdig on the visibility and security side uh, can actually span both virtual machines and containers, um, but also can span all of your Kubernetes environments. Um, they provide a healthy amount of templated dashboards um, that right out of the box immediately provide value to teams, both operational teams or application teams. Um, and that's kind of the next piece, which is the, the team visibility, I think, is really, really powerful. And I'll talk about that when we go through the, the, the demo a little bit. But being able to separate who can see data versus who has access to a resource where they can almost affect that data. Uh, it's nice to separate those two um, groups. Uh, another aspect that I think we're going to focus a little bit on here is going to be the runtime protection. Um, with Falco and Sysdig Secure, there is a vast amount of ways to protect the running workloads. So this works in, you know, in conjunction with things like Anthos Policy Controller, but focus purely on the runtime aspect and, and less about um, you know, the admission controller and, and things that are about to be deployed. Um, and then really the one area that I don't see a lot of other people diving into that I, I feel is unique to Sysdig is um, the application forensics side of this or the container forensics. And this is a huge attraction to a lot of security operations teams that when something does go wrong in the environment, we want to be able to analyze why and what it was, what happened. Um, so, so that's it for slides. I'm going to pivot over to the demo side. Um, we don't like to, to do too much 
on the slide side. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a look and just show you that I've got really no um, none of the Sysdig components currently deployed in my Anthos cluster. So what you're seeing in front of you right now is the Google Anthos dashboard in, in the UI. So Merrick did a great job of showing everything by the command line. I'm going to be a little bit more um, UI driven. And what this is going to show you is that I've got a couple of clusters registered with Anthos configuration management. Um, and one is a dev cluster and one is a prod cluster. And the flexibility here being that I want to be able to possibly define different policies or different configurations between dev and prod, but keep them mostly the same. So we can tell that we've got them both synchronized and everything's happy, which is great. If I take a look at my, my Sysdig monitor dashboard here, you're going to see that in the last you know, few minutes, I've got no data from my host because I don't have any hosts that are registered right now. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Anthos Configuration Management to go ahead and deploy the Sysdig agent. Now, the Sysdig agent uh, can be deployed a number of different ways. In this particular case, uh, we are going to just use the manifests, and we're going to apply those manifests uh, through a GitOps approach into uh, our ACM repository. So what I've just done, if you take a look, this, this is the, the top level root of, of my ACM folder. So what I'm synchronizing here, take a look at either one of these clusters, I'm synchronizing the Cystic demo slash ACM folder. Underneath it, I've got a namespace that I've just added uh, called Cystic agent. And then I've also got a couple of um, cluster role bindings to allow the agent to communicate with the cluster appropriately. The Inside of the Cystic agent folder, I've got a number of different things, a service account, service. Um, I've got a secret. And um, the secret is you should probably use Vault and the injector service to handle the secret. You should not be deploying this inside of a, a secret configuration file as I am here. Um, what Merrick had just shown you was is the better approach to store your um, Cystic token. Got a name, namespace definition and then you know, the important parts would be the daemon set, which allows us to run the agent, as well as uh, we've added the image analyzer daemon set. So this will allow us to do in-cluster vulnerability scanning. You actually have the option of doing both. You can do um, SaaS-based vulnerability scanning where um, the platform will contact your registry or on, like in-cluster image scanning where we've got a daemon set that's running that's actually scanning your applications. And then you'll notice here, I've got two configurations and they're both almost the same with the exception that ultimately I want to have a different name for each cluster. So I want one cluster to show up in the dashboard as dev and one to show up as prod. Um, so basically that's the difference here. And I've got a couple of tags as well just to help differentiate the environments. And you'll see why this is important when we get into the dashboard. The other side of this is that when you're using Anthos configuration management, we can have targeted configurations in the same repo for specific clusters. So we have the annotation that says, I want to apply this to dev and dev only. So those are all the manifests that we need to deploy this. Um, we've got them ready to go. We're going to do our commit. And then we're going to open up pull request as we would in a GitOps format. Your VS Code game gets stronger every time I see you, Shay. More integrations. <laughs> I don't. You know what? I, I use I use a few less these days, but the GitHub one I do like a lot. So that pull request is just opening right now. And of course, if I click the button, then it would have continued on. So we're going to jump over to. The GitHub UI, just to know that it's all doing what we wanted it to do. There it is. So in a, in a GitOps approach, um, which is gaining a massive amount of traction and required for something like ACM, you know, this would go to um, somebody to approve appropriately before we actually merge this into the branch. I'm going to confirm that merge. And so once that's done now, we can actually switch our branch back. We'll see this update in a second. I'm going to go back here to our demo main. Cool. So we're now synchronized up here, and we've got our Cystic agent ready to deploy. 
You can see here in the dashboard again, we're just going to check the status, but uh, our, our agents should start to deploy quite soon. So what I'm going to do is switch over to the CLI and just do a QCL get namespace. And what I've done is I've separated each of my clusters. And so you know which, which cluster I'm in based off of either a prod app namespace or a dev app namespace. In this case, I'm on the prod cluster. And we can just check the pods. Is that the old uh, red screen trick, Shay? So people don't mess up being in prod when they think they're in dev? Uh, Kyle knows my trick. It's always always try to make the terminal red if, if you're in prod. <laughs> Sometimes we need visual cues. So I've done that with a lot of clusters and tools in the past. So we've got our agents running and our image analyzer. So, so that's all good. Let's go and check in with the Sysdig dashboard itself. Cool. All right. So this is just a quick level, quick high level to show, hey, we have some agents and there's some stuff going on. Great. This view isn't terribly helpful to me, um, mostly because I'm looking at container IDs. But we can switch our context and start to look at something a little more Kubernetes native, something like, hey, look at all my namespaces. Oh, I could drive into a particular application um, and understand more about that application. So the view I'm showing you right here is what we call Explore. This is no different than something like Grafana, where we want to explore all the metrics um, and capabilities that we have of the system. But this is just about exploring data. So. Um, it's not a full set dashboard, but you can select any given option or scope level and actually um, bring up one of the templated items. So let's say you see on the right-hand side, I've got my Kubernetes deployment overview. And this is a pre-built dashboard that's available for consumption as teams drive in. Now, obviously, the application hasn't been running for, a, for long enough for it to collect a ton of data to show anything here, but this will start to populate in a few minutes. The other thing I'm going to do is just generate some traffic to that application as well. All right. So really where I want to start, I think that the highest level value is the Kubernetes overview. As we jump in, you're going to see clusters list, listed out. And as the cube state metrics start to come in in the next few minutes, we'll return to this in a little bit, you'll start to see the data points start to populate here. And what you're going to do is have very quick high level understanding of how healthy the cluster is. We can drive down a little bit into all of the nodes that make up each one of the environments, or then the namespaces, right? And this kind of keeps going down into deeper levels, but it's an easy access item for, for new teams who want to jump in and understand what's happening. Where one of the problems that we find is as new operational teams on board to understand their environments, they get they struggle with having to learn what Kubernetes is before they understand if it's healthy or not. And the purpose here is to kind of provide some high level insight. Now, if we go to the dashboard area, there's a lot of templated dashboards. And this is where I think some of the huge value comes in. If we take a look at Kubernetes here, we can actually pick any one of these templated dashboards. So if we take a look at the health overview, you're gonna see all the data starting to flow in now, but then we can start to drop this down by any scope or, or refine our scope here. So if I wanna pick on, let's say, um, my cluster. I want to separate between dev and prod. I can add that scope filter and it's going to reduce the amount of data that's coming in and focus only on what I want to see. Or let's say I want to focus on that application, right? So I'm going to pick on uh, Kubernetes. I'm going to drop down into, uh, let's pick on Kubernetes service health. And let's pick my app called Monitor App. This is a voting application here that if you, if you like cats or dogs, you can go ahead and check your vote. You can tell that I particularly like dogs a little bit more. Please don't hold it against me if that bothers you. Now, based off the resolution of the screen, it's a little bit, you know, I guess what I would say is there's a lot of data here. What I would do is actually um, create a custom dashboard from this and start to remove panels. What you're going to see coming in with these these sort of uh, charts that are coming in is you're seeing like actual network latency um, between certain services. So this is the result app that's actually posting a 288 microsecond late or millisecond latency. And so these are immediately available to any new team that comes on board and just wants to scope into their application without doing any other instrumentation. If we go back to 
the explore page, there's another interesting sort of view that, that some people like to look at, which focuses on the topology. And so sometimes if we're trying to determine if there's something going wrong inside of the application or we're seeing performance slowdowns, then ultimately we want to be able to see if we can help pinpoint where the latency is coming, where the latency problems are coming in. So now we can see all of our pods communicating with different aspects of our, of our application and what actual network throughput is coming through, or if we actually have, um, uh, we're going to look at a response time as well. So again, I, I think the idea there, what I want to highlight is all of, the, all of these capabilities and these pre-CAN dashboards provide a great way for both operations teams to understand the true health of their cluster. Um, being able to look at something, let's say, like um, CPU usage and allocation, one of the biggest problems we see in a lot of environments is that people are over-requesting over and under-utilizing uh, their resources. Um, it provides immediate reporting on the health of the system, but also provides dashboards that are a little bit more focused on um, the application team. And what I want to just quickly highlight is that there is this concept of teams. And so as you configure a new team, you can scope them down to only a few namespaces. So they're only looking at the data that's relevant to them. And all of this can be underpinned by um, your SSO configuration. So it's not actually tied to the way Anthos deploys its access control. This is actually a really important piece because the way you need to orchestrate sometimes your Anthos deployment has a lot of access control routing to get metrics into a place where both teams and operators can view and use the data appropriately. And, and that has to often be customized by an, an enterprise. In this particular case, um, it's a separate access control system that can use your own SSO and your own team structure. Uh, and is really, really flexible at giving both ops and dev teams and security teams the views that they're each looking for. Um, so I'm gonna quickly just take a look here at our event stream again as we talk about multi-cloud or even VMs and containers together, all of this data rolls up into Sysdig and um, they're also pulling in Prometheus metrics, StatsD and, and a few other, and JMX metrics and things like that. It's all funneling into a single area. Um, and we also have a single event feed. So then we can alert or alarm on these types of events, right? We can easily select something that we wanna know about and actually create an alert from that if we wish to. And we can dump alerts into Slack or PagerDuty or things like that. And finally, inside of this monitor view um, that I'll highlight quickly is the capture metric, uh, the capture capability where you can, on an event and with an alert, let's say if I selected this one here, at the very bottom, you can also set it to, I think I chose the wrong one. Let's do container died. Yeah, I'm missing it here. I'll show you in the other window. Uh, you can do assisted capture and it will, it will trigger off an actual full capture of the event and then upload it to the capture area where we'll do Sysdig inspect. So that's the monitor piece. Um, but I wanna jump into the security side. So if we kind of go to the top, there's a secure and monitor applications. And most of this is running from the same agent. Uh, and that's a little bit important to understand only in that we don't wanna run a ton of agents inside of our environments or sometimes agents conflict. So the same Sysdig agent is doing the security enforcement as well. Um, however, if you want to do on-host analysis, we're also running that separate daemon set to actually do our vulnerability management. So quickly, uh, we talked about being able to do vulnerability scanning, and absolutely this capability exists. Um, I'm just going to quickly highlight that we've got a report section where we can run a report based off everything in our environment or do dynamic filtering on images that we want to, that we care about. And this will just give us, yeah, let's go ahead and log back in again. And so what this will do is this will give us a view of everything across um, all of our clusters and all of our environments, and then that will give us some information or some, some help, right? You can also download this and send this off to the, to the SecOps team, but I would encourage teams to give access to the security operations team. In the secure application area, we have the same capability where we can build separate teams with different scopes, or we can also give application teams access to their own scope, which is really, really important because we want to give the team access to their own vulnerability data without having to show them everything across the infrastructure or enterprise. 
as we jump down through the image scanning, you can set policies and you can set exceptions. I mean, this is all a little bit par for the course on, um, on vulnerability management. It's been done before, um, but there is a really good and effective dashboard here to use it. But then we've also got policies that can be scoped to things like NIST or PCI, which is really helpful. And as a service consumer from the system platform, they are constantly updating those definitions, which is really, really helpful. And in your policies, you can also do a number of customizations that are really powerful. So if you want to make sure that your Docker files are formed in certain ways and built certain ways, uh, here is where you can apply a said policy. Right, we've got things like um, making sure that the user uh, you know, is or isn't being used, making sure that, that port 22 isn't being used or making sure that we're not, we don't have a high severity vulnerability running in our image. Um, these types of modifications will need to be tweaked a little bit, but uh, out of the box, they're, they're quite effective right away. As we move down the security list, we talk about benchmarks. So you can continuously scan and alert on compliance of your Kubernetes cluster. So if there are configurations that aren't as secure as they should be, you can work towards making that better and then also be alerted when they fall into compliance. But really what I, I, I kind of want to hit on the most is uh, one of my favorite hats from the, from the team as well, which is the sort of the Falco hat that I've got going on here. Um, the Falco open source security runtime and, and policy engine from Sysdig is the under, underlying agent here that is actually gonna help us with our runtime protection. So um, what we've got are a couple of different things, uh, a lot of rules and a library that they publish that is quite powerful. So we can, we can filter based off things like um, a particular compliance standard, right? So like NIST or PCI, or we could do something that's Kubernetes specific, right? And pick up particular um, types of rules that we want to apply to our environment. And these are not all currently in, in force. These are just things that we can pull from. So we can do something like, you know, create a rule that says, you know, if they create a disallowed namespace, do something else, like notify us or stop it from happening. So it's quite an effective list of rules um, that is already there available for you to consume. Um, there's also, you know, a way to create your own rules. And there's a full sort of Falco documentation exercise that you can go through to build your own custom rules that are applicable to your own environment. And then we take those rules and really what happens is we push those into a policy. And I'm gonna show you a couple of different uh, you know, examples here, but really what, what I wanted to show you and why I have two different clusters is that the capability of Sysdig to scope something down to a particular cluster or workload just through metadata tags is incredibly powerful. So here I've got the shell process um, in prod. So what I'm looking for in my prod cluster, now this could be by namespace or by a metadata tag on a container. There's, there's a whole lot of sort of descriptors. Um, I'm gonna focus on the prod cluster and I'm gonna look for people trying to run shell and try to exec into it. And if that happens, I'm going to kick off assisted, assisted capture and I'm gonna kill the process. Now that's for prod, but let's just say I wanna be able to give that capability to my teams in dev. I want them to be able to get in, but I wanna be aware of it so I can notify, but not necessarily kill or stop the process. So at this point, I'm gonna switch back over to my cluster. I'm still in prod right now. So I'm gonna switch over to my dev. I'm gonna try to exec into this pod. You can see, I can see everything. I can exec in and that's totally fine. It totally works. Uh, however, should have some alert coming in shortly that will look much like this one. Um, where I've shelled in and it'll give me a bunch of details about that. And I'll show you what that looks like in, in the Sysdig dashboard in a second. But what I'm gonna do now is switch into prod, and, uh, try the same thing. Okay, if I can type.
so, so this is a case, Shay, where we want developers to be able to troubleshoot and be able to sort things out in lower environments, but we need to put some security around production. So just, you know, by managing policy and annotations and things like that, we can start to not apply friction to the environment, but also be able to audit and provide compliance to make sure that, you know, we're, we're respecting security rules and, and prod, but you know, yeah. push yeah. forward innovation in lower environments. Yeah, this is this is about in, ensuring that the runtime in production has the right aspects applied, but we give capability to other teams and we give them visibility so they know why they got denied. Like right here, you can see I got terminated. Well, if they're really very curious and want to know why, I mean, you're going to see these these particular notifications coming in, right? So I've integrated this with Slack, but there's nothing hiding that even if if you give them the right access to go and look at the event inside of here as well. Right. And so here you can actually see that I got killed in there and you can see all the data about it, which which container, which environment, which cluster, which all of that stuff. This is hugely powerful to give to the team so they understand the context and they're not hunting down the security guys. Um, on the flip side of this, uh, we've also done something really interesting, which is we created a capture. And so that capture allowed the SecOps team to say, hey, there was an event that happened and we want we want that you know that dvr or the black box of the container and we want to be able to analyze it and so what you've got here is they have access to the scap file which then allows us to do things like jump into the inspect utility and actually take a look at what's going wrong so here this is actually the application or the container image uh, that i was using and i ran bin bash and then it kicked me out um, so that that does give teams the forensic capability as well on top of any workload running in in any of the Google Anthos clusters. And nice. I think that is actually all I wanted to show you today. Uh, that's that's about it. So I hope that that's given you a, a good sort of understanding of, I think, how the Cystic Secure and runtime enforcement piece really complements a multi-cloud deployment strategy that Anthos is providing. Cool. That was great, Jay. And yeah, I really like the the Teams feature. You know, we, we always are big believers in let's let people see data. Let's let other users be able to see what's going on in the system. It doesn't mean they have to have right access to the system, but, you know, passing on data and being able to secure that, build custom dashboards, you know, as ops people, if, if your phone rings a little bit less, you know, put the information in the power of the person managing the platform and um, they will do great things with it is kind of my belief. So. And letting them both work off the same data set, I think is also really helpful. So, just as, a, as an anecdote for one of our customers, we have built a Kubernetes Teams operator deployment system. So the teams, all they need to do is define their Cystic team inside of their Kube cluster, and then it goes and builds it for them. And they have immediate access to, to just the things they need to see. Um, yeah. Yeah, all right, Paul, I'll push up your screen. Paul's up next. Um, I would say the other thing I... Um, I really like is in almost every one of these backstage passes events, we've we built the clusters off a Git repo using Anthos config management. So the repeatability and reliability, not just from the, how the cluster's configured, but laying down other tools like Vault, like we talked about, the, the Cystic mm -hmm. agent even set that's required, um, CI tools. It, it really becomes this kind of perfect workflow for people, um, but you do need to put the work in up front designing the, the kind of Git flows and, and things like that. Yeah. So. All right, Paul. So over to uh, over to you for the last demo, and then um, we got Seth uh, coming up next. Um, so stay tuned. Like I said, any questions you have, anything you want us to talk about with uh, with Seth, just pump them in the uh, the chat, and um, we'll kind of kick things off. So over to you, Paul. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Kyle. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, GitLab and uh, and Anthos. Um, so uh, yeah, just a you know brief thing about myself. I'm, just sort of focused on mainly automation, configuration, management, Kubernetes, blah, 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 all that stuff. So, um, and the pieces that I'm going to be talking about specifically are, are um, uh, several Anthos clusters. So I have an Anthos, I have a couple of Anthos GKE clusters, uh, and I have an Anthos GKE on-prem cluster. Um, there's some Anthos config management, which is something you just saw in the last demo as well with uh, Sysdig. Uh, the policy controller, um, I'm going to be using GitLab, uh, GitLab repo and the CI that comes with it. And I'm going to show you some customized stuff as well. So, um, and I just, there, there's only three slides, but I just wanted to show you this diagram really quick. So you might get a sense of what's going on here. So the idea with this is that, um, 
Uh, I have two separate repos, one for the Anthos platform, which is basically controlled by ACM. And then I have another one, which is which, I, which is a small sort of Go app that, that that would be controlled by a developer that that can push um, their application up to the up to the repo and get deployed on the clouds. But the the point of this is that the the ACM repo actually builds out and and sort of templates the namespace for the application developer. Um, so. I just wanted to show you that really quickly. These, these arrows sort of like, you know, this isn't in sequence. It's just showing you sort of what has, what happens is the oper once the ACM operator is installed on the clusters, it goes and reads the, the repo, uh, anything in that repo and deploys. Um, uh, in this case, I'm deploying the Git runner, the GitLab runner in, in every, every one of the namespaces. So the GitLab runner scope to that namespace on each of the clusters. And then uh, once that's done, uh, that GitLab runner can talk back to the GitLab CI instance. And um, then the, uh, from the developer side, we can actually have another repo, which has the Go app and, and uh, Docker files and stuff. And we can build from there and, uh, and have GitLab um, uh, push, or GitLab CI push for us. Uh, so that's what I wanted to show you there really quickly um, and I'll get into the demo. So uh, so the first thing I wanted to show you with this is is just the, I, I guess there's a GitHub, GitHub repo that I used to actually build all this stuff. Um, the, the clusters aren't really important. It's just some Terraform code that that uh, that I used to build the clusters. But what is important is is sort of the the configuration management. So ACM is set up on all these clusters and they're all pointing back to the, the Anthos platform um, Git repo, which is living on the Git, GitLab. So uh, GitLab is here. So so this is a GitLab instance. So on one of these clusters um, called Backstage GitLab, there's the GitLab instances running. Um, and and uh, in this Anthos platform re repository is the ACM configuration. So um, basically, it's, it looks like your sort of standard ACM config um, cluster, cluster um, uh, wide uh, um, configuration go in the cluster config uh, the cluster uh, directory. Um, so I need a GitLab runner um, permission set, which is this, which gets deployed on all the clusters. Um, much like uh, um, the one we just saw with Sysdig, there's um, I have to I specified uh, the cluster selector. So there's a cluster selector for every single um, every single cluster, so that we could we could specify what goes on there, what doesn't go on there. In my case, I'm just I'm putting the GitLab runner on every every one of these, so I just built configuration for all of them. Um, so they're all basically uniform. Uh, and then in the namespace, so this is the the namespace that I, that ACM is creating is called Go App, and that's where the actual application code will will go and uh, we've got uh, basically a GitLab uh, service account, um, the configuration map for every one of the clusters. So um, basically, in here you have the runner that, that the runner config, um, and we're actually marking the runner config with uh, with a tag so that it's it's specified and labeled back to the to the actual um, namespace and, and GitLab runner that it's allowed to run on that cluster. Um, the namespace is just a, the creation of the namespace, and then secrets. The same thing goes here. Is is uh, actually the secrets file? I'm I'm I've, I'm actually putting the registration runner in here, but that should be sort of stored in Vault uh, for this. So um, that's what I wanted to show you there. And then so we go to the Go app. Uh, so this was a develop. This is the developer branch or uh, developer um, uh, repo. Um, so basically, there's a there's a Go file that that. You know, the, it's a sort of silly little Go app that runs um, doesn't do doesn't do very much. You'll see it in a sec. Um, the Docker file. Uh, what I wanted to show you here is the GitLab CI portion of this, right? So this is just the the build build portion. So uh, basically, when when the pipeline kicks off, it'll run it'll run a build. So it will build the actual Go um, binary uh, into a container, and then it publishes that container on onto a GCR. I use GCR for all of this stuff. Uh, and then it will simultaneously deploy on all three of the clouds. So um, it'll basically go into the uh, the the Great White North cluster, um, the uh, the US cloud one, which is basically the GitLab instance itself, and then the on-prem cluster, which is called Arctic Paul. Uh, so what I think we're going to do here, uh, the last thing I should show you is this. So this, uh, this stuff is... Um, so in the in the K8s S directory is is basically customized. So if you're familiar with customized, it's it's actually a pretty uh, 
pretty great thing. It's it you can you can specify a base conf, uh, config, and then from that base config, you can you can add or patch it to whatever deployment you're actually deploying on. So this, this is you know this is a really simple thing, but basically the base config calls service and deployment YAMLs um, for Kubernetes. They're very, very straightforward deployments. Basically, I'm you know labeling the thing as a Go app, um, building it out, putting a CPU and RAM memory, sort of standard standard deployment. Uh, and the service is a, is is pretty much the same. I'm just basically using a load balancer service here. There's there's no there's no Istio installed or anything, so it, it's really straightforward. Um, but what's interesting with this is here in the overlays, um, I've got a specification for every one of my clouds. So um, if you go to CI, the CA cloud, um, in the customization, it's going to run base, and then it's also going to tag the image, right? The image that I want to actually use. And this one, the on-prem one's a little more interesting because uh, with the on-prem instance, there's, so the, the two, the two, the US and the CA cluster are, um, are GKE clusters and use the GKE load balancer. Um, the on-prem cluster it uses the Seesaw load balancer. So uh, one thing that it cannot do is dynamically generate a, an IP address for the load balancer VIP. So what I did was actually patch that, that VIP. So I'm basically specifying the service and then and then using the and then assigning this 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 load balancer VIP. Um, and it will basically patch and overwrite that customized file. So I'm um, gonna show you that real quick. Let's uh, and customize is um let's see where I am first. So customize is uh is actually built right into the um into the command line now, into the cube controls, which is very cool. So you don't, it's not even a separate separate binary if I could spell it custom eyes and then you what you can do is just uh on-prem so so this is basically like an, an in-house kind of rendering of this so um so if you look at this the service what it's done is it's actually patched that load balancer thing which was not the load balancer IP was not in the standard the standard um template and this will run just for the uh just for the on-prem cluster so uh now that that's done let's uh, let's actually build the app um, so it's got to do a, you guys can still see my screen. I'm just making sure I'm not, is it? Okay. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, cool. Oh, we're just going to, uh, build this out. Commit. Shem, build my app. Okay. So now I'm pushing to the Go, uh, the Go repo, which is here, and the pipelines are set. Uh, one thing I actually should show you. So there's the the pipelines here, and it's going to do a build. Um, one thing I forgot to show you here is uh, in the admin area, which is kind of interesting. So so the runners that I was talking about before. So these runners are actually these are the runners that are all running inside of that inside of that namespace, and you can see they're scoped to. The, the the clusters themselves. So each so there's one for backstage GitLab, there's one for Arctic Paul, and there's one for um, for the Great White North cluster, and they're locked down so they can only be used with these tags. Um, and let's go back to back to the pipeline. See what it's doing. So it's going to take too long. So the build's finished. Um, this is just basically a compile of the of the Docker, uh, or sorry, Docker of the of the Go app. And and the next bit is the publish. So this publish is basically like um, building out the the container image and then uploading that container image to the to the GCR. Which you can see here. Those are all the clusters. So here's the container registry. There's a whole bunch of images in here because I've run this thing uh, about a million times and it's worked every time. <laughs> like right <laughs> from the get-go. Yeah, yeah. So it's running. Uh, it only takes a minute or so, but yeah, there, the job's successful. Uh, and let's go back to here. And so what's going to happen now is it actually does a... Uh, it speeds up there. There we go. Uh, so it's deploying on all three of the clouds right now. So 
So there's that one. Um, and this, so this thing's deploying. I, I do, I do, a, I try, I'm um, doing a Kubernetes get all just to, just to sort of dump out some information about what's actually, what's actually there, but you'll see the runners are in that, in that namespace, but we, to get a better view of this. So, uh, so cube face go up. I'm on the GitLab cluster right now. Come on. There it is. And so there's my there's the runner so that's sitting there and there's the there's the go app which I just deployed 43 seconds ago. If we go to the external load balancer IP, we can oops, that's not what I had to do. Over here. And there's my Go app. So version two, simple Go app that does nothing. Basically, all this thing does is uh, is is grab the IP that it's on, uh, put this print out the time and 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 the host name of the pod itself. So, uh, wow, super exciting uh, Go app there. And uh, the one thing I'll show you too is the on-prem one. So, yeah, um I think I'm in that namespace, so we'll see. Yep. So there. So that's the. This is the. This is the IP that I actually specified on the um, through the through the customize. Oop, wrong way. Sorry about that. And we're right here. And this is the other one. So so this is the bleeding edge version. So they're running the alpha version of the uh, of the container um, because they're. Those guys on the on-prem are crazy. And we can just go to the other one. Eight boy north. <sighs> Wrong one. Next. So this guy is just running a, come on. Huh. Wow, that took a really long time. Nope. Oh. Okay, and this guy is running a different version. There, it's 115, so it's an older version. Um, and I showed you already where you spec where we specified that. So what we can do with this is there's in customize, um, basically picking out which version of the of the um, application to or the container to to run. So so upgrading this thing is as simple as just is just building out your customization file. You, all you have to do basically let's say the the um, the conservative Canadians want to move to what the U.S. is doing, so you just can set that to two point zero, which would change the the version. And this is simple. The type. Oh my God. And all you'd have to do, obviously, is just do another. Whoops, another git push. We'll kick off another pipeline. Commit. Now that will that will run another branch or sorry another pipeline. Uh, that'll run another pipeline here. So same type of thing. It's going to run another pipeline. It's going to publish publish the the, the um, container image again, and then deploy them on all the on all the clouds. And the only one that will actually change is the uh, is the CA cloud, which will which will get a different version. So we'll wait for that one to run. Um, and then the next thing I want to show you is um, uh, some policy stuff. So so as I was saying, the um, the GitLab. So the the ACM bit of this. Um, which is this? Yeah, this. Um, this. These are the synced clusters that I have. This is the ACM. This is looking into the ACM configuration. 
Um, they're all synced right now because there has been no changes on the ACM side. Before I started the demo, I, I basically deployed the runner because it kind of took a little while. Um, but what we can do with the ACM part is is um, we can. So in this one, we in the Anthos platform, which would be which would be typically run by by an operations team, not the developers themselves. Um, we can go in here and oops, and uh, we can manipulate the namespace itself. So what we can do is under that go app, we can we can copy. Uh, copy a policy here um, and what that policy does is it actually denies the network connectivity to the go app um, if you're running uh, if you're if your if your cluster is enabled with network policy now in in this in this demo, uh, the the one that is enabled with with um, network policy is my on-prem cluster. So when I actually push this, um, it will block all traffic to the on-prem cluster. So, but before I do that, I just let's find out what's going on with the pipeline there. There's CA, so the cloud CA part's done. So this should be our new version. Uh, so it was 105, 105. So there. Two, so pretty straightforward. Grab the other, grab the new version. Now we can go back to here, and uh, with this, so so because this is run by ACM, you got to make a commit on the ACM branch. Um, so I'll do this, get commit block on brim push. Now, it's nothing to do with GitLab. This is just purely ACM stuff. And we can watch these clusters. Oh, so there's you see, you see pending. So this is this is actually being that that um, network policy is being applied to to all three clusters. Um, but the only one that actually has network policy enabled is the Arctic Paul cluster. Um, so if we go back to here, and we try to hit that VIP fifty eight, it just hangs. You're basically blocking all network traffic from the lo from once once it gets inside. As soon as it sees a, an ID of of Go app, it will it just drops the traffic. So this this traffic is is kind of is you can't get to the cluster anymore. Now this is a, a kind of a you know a really basic example, but but just to show you that that you can apply any type of like overarching cluster or namespace policy directly from the platform layer. It can apply to all clusters kind of at once. And um, that can be controlled by kind of an operations group that would that would be directly affecting the application or the namespace that, that the developers are are kind of in. So, so and that was that was that that was all I had to show you guys actually. Awesome, <clears throat> thanks, yep. Paul. Um, yep, no I love seeing. Uh, I, I don't think people realize how many um, how many use cases GitLab can actually solve for. We had a we had a conversation with a customer today who was thinking about like full integrations, like how do we marry our bug tracking and and uh, feature requests and stuff and work that workflow in, um, you know, and they're they're thinking like what's the golden interface to do this whole new age CI CD thing? And I think we're getting pretty close with something like GitLab, GitLab to be that place to go to 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 do merge requests and pull requests and be able to have this graphical you know interface that yeah, not everybody going to use but a lot of people will use it at the same time it's, so. it's fantastically powerful because you can the ci the cd deployment piece can be sort of like templated out properly put, put to each namespace and then that back connects to the gitlab server and then from a developer point of view that's all you really need to worry about is just what's happening in gitlab you don't need to worry about any of that operational stuff so yeah it's really really powerful and cool. it's all locked down. Yep. Very cool. And I uh, shout out to Amat. We're still using your your CTX your Cube CTX uh, cluster switch. <laughs> I just put that on this morning. It's great. <laughs> he was on our, our last backstage. So, all right. So, without further ado, I am adding in our special guest. I didn't give him a warning, so I just woke him up there. Uh, hey, Seth. <laughs> hey, Carl. Good. Good. How are you doing? Well, man. So, uh, yeah. First off, thanks for for joining our backstage event. With all people at Google, they're always so um, generous with their time. So, I'd reached out to Seth and thought it would be uh, great to have a chat with him. I know the team got excited when I let him know who our special guest uh, this week was. Um, so, yeah, I think we're the, we're not going to put him on the spot for any demos today. We just wanted to have a kind of a 
casual conversation, get some insight and, uh, you know, just share the knowledge with the community. These events are very meant to be very community based and to help customers see what's possible. Um, so that's what we're here for today. So, um, so yeah, Seth, maybe give us a quick intro. I know you've, you've got an illustrious career. You've done some stuff at Chef. You've done some cool stuff at HashiCorp. And now you're at Google Cloud as a, a staff engineer. So well, what's going on? What are you up to these days? Yeah, sure. So uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Seth. Uh, I work on our developer relations team at Google. Um, but I also currently wear three hats. Um, I don't know if any of you are experiencing this, but uh, some people's jobs are changing a little bit in light of COVID. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone's aware there's a global pandemic. I hope that wasn't a shock. <laughs> I heard something about that. <laughs> uh, maybe you heard it on the uh, the turntables. Uh, but the um, uh, so while I normally do developer advocacy, I, I spend a lot of time meeting customers where they are, like in physical locations, uh, but also getting on stages and talking about software. Uh, sometimes deeply technical, sometimes at a very high level thought leadery. Um, obviously, not a lot of that is happening, or it's happening digitally. We're the time investment is actually a little bit less because you don't spend 20 hours on an airplane to get to Singapore. You just digitally go there. Um, so I decided to take this time to do a rotation as a product manager. Um, I have been involved in the secrets management space for a while. So I'm a product manager for Secret Manager, which is our first party secrets management solution on Google Cloud. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but then more recently um, and somewhat altruistically, I became involved in the COVID contact tracing initiative that Google and Apple and now Microsoft are working on together. Um, so Google and Apple are working on it from the Android and iOS side and Google and Microsoft are working on it on the server side components. Um, and we're likely in a position where you know some of the code that I'm writing and designs that I'm building are uh, hopefully going to be used at a national level in the United States to try to stop the spread of uh, COVID. So, uh, really proud of that work, really excited. And also I'm in charge of security and privacy. So also very scared make sure that we're doing privacy preserving uh, contact tracing um, at a, a, you know, a, at the most granular level. That's um, awesome. Uh, like Kyle said before that, uh, so I've been at Google just under three years. Prior to that, I was at HashiCorp for four and a half years. I was employee number four at HashiCorp, um, original author of Vault, worked very heavily on Terraform and Vagrant and Packer and Console. Um, wrote lots of tooling, uh, ran developer relations there for a while. Um, and before that, I worked at Chef Software uh, for three and a half years. So I uh, get, did a lot of work in like the DevOps um, and infrastructure automation space. Yeah, you've been around the block, man. It's, uh, it's awesome. And I think it's cool, as you say, it's nice to be able to apply technical projects to like the human element of what's going on in this world today. So being able to you know, solve some of these low level secret managements that the user never really sees, but they have trust in, you know, their, their partner or their cloud provider protecting them. Um, you know, this, this whole contract tracing, I think is going to be critically important, but it's obviously very controversial for privacy reasons. So having, having a tight eye on data and, and privacy is something Google's always done. And obviously you've kind of eat bread and sleep a lot of that the last several years thinking about how to make things more secure and more automated. So um, that's great to hear, man. And I, I think just to segue into a, a secret management topic is it's one of those, like if we, if we look back at Merrick's demo, it's one of those things you talk to a customer and you show them, okay, there's this new Kubernetes thing, you know, it's table stakes. Now you're buying into it. Now it's time to turn the gas on. Um, but the way you provide identity and access management and secrets across applications is completely changed. Like Paul showed a little piece around network policy of more of your firewall perspective, like this can talk to this in a new age software way. Um, but I've never seen someone kind of push back on the, the requirement for modern secret management and dynamic secrets. But at the same time, I think it's pretty daunting for some of these enterprise customers, like it's a whole new paradigm for them. Um, what kind of conversations are you seeing with customers that, you know, they want that, but it's not like a turnkey solution. It requires a lot of education and change um, inside the organization. Yeah. So like, it, especially companies that have been around a very long time, you know, quote unquote enterprises, right. They're seeing this migration to cloud and they have to rethink a lot of things, right. Uh, on premise, you have your firewall and all data that moves in and out of that firewall is is guarded and inspected and analyzed and, then you move to the cloud and you know customers come to Google and they say, okay, here's my F5. Can you please install it in your data center? Hmm. Um, and we say, no, right? We don't do that uh, unless you pay us a lot of money. Um, but ultimately, even if, even if we were willing to do that for a customer, it kind of defeats the purpose of cloud computing, right? Yeah. 
We really want to leverage the elasticity and scale of the cloud. Um, and the moment you're relying on, you know, some custom hardware device to do authentication and authorization, um, you're breaking that model, but you're also not practicing good security uh, or, or best security because you're building a model in which everything inside the castle is trusted and everything outside the castle is untrusted. And we know from experience and in the industry that that's not actually how these systems work, right? At um, even if you, and, and we know this isn't how the world works, right? If you look back in like medieval times, um, we didn't just put a moat around the castle, right? If we just put a moat around the castle, then anyone who can swim could make their way into the castle. Like there were still guards, the, the princess or the king was still heavily guarded with multiple layers of intrusion detection. And even if, you know, we look at some of the architecture that's left behind, you'll notice that like staircases were designed and optimized for the, um, the people who lived in that kingdom, right? They were uh, designed in such a way that they gave right-handed people an advantage because they would curve up and to the right which meant if you were taking a sword and swinging as a right-handed person, you had an advantage over someone who was coming up the stairs, right? All of these things, like we practiced defense in depth as a civilization um, very early on, right? And arguably at that time, it was truly life or death. But those same principles apply to us as we migrate to the cloud, right? No one's wielding swords, hopefully, uh, in the cloud. But the same principle of like, how are attackers going to approach our system and can we gain the advantage um, can we gain an advantage and can we use tactics that we know and anomaly detection to find them in the system? And then ultimately, again, going back to medieval times, the best security model is one in which you just assume that you're going to be compromised. And that's why we see, you know, you look at medieval architecture, there's lots of escape tunnels. There's lots of ways to get the leadership out of the kingdom so that they can maintain continuity. We even see this, you know, in the U.S. government, right? We know there's a lot of uh, escape hatches in and out of the White House and various government buildings to get officials out in the event of a disaster so that we can maintain continuity. And those same practices should apply to your systems, right? You should assume that an attacker is going to make their way in, whether it's because of some bad code that gave them remote code execution that got that made its way into production and passed all of your security checks, or if it's something totally outside of your control, like, spec like Spectre or Meltdown or some CPU level vulnerability that you weren't even thinking about. The moment that you assume that an attacker can gain access to your system, the better off your security models will be. All too often, organizations spend so much time preventing as opposed to detecting. And we just saw an amazing demo of, of Falco from Sysdig, which can be used as a tool, at the, again, at the very low level, at the kernel layer, to try to detect when these things are happening. But detection is the first step. The second step is response. So don't just invest in detecting and don't just invest in um, prevention or, or defense, you actually have to invest in automating your security response. And this is where things like dynamic credentials and automated rotation are super important. Um, can you right now click a button and rotate all of your credentials? Anytime someone leaves the company, can you rotate anything they had access to? It's the CEO's birthday. There's no better time to rotate credentials. <laughs> Federal holiday, midnight on a Saturday, there's no better time to rotate credentials. Do you know why? Because that's when attackers are going to rotate and or that's when attackers are going to try to gain access to your system. They're not going to gain access to your system during normal business hours. They're going to do it when they think you're asleep. They're going to do it when they think that you're off work. An adversarial employee who's leaving the company, even on the best of terms, um, you know, they may leave the company and they say, oh, I left the company. I'm going to publish my dot files to GitHub now so that everyone can check out my cool Vim config, right? And inadvertently, their SSH key gets uploaded and that SSH key actually has access to production systems at your company. Maybe they're leaving and they're a rogue employee and they're like, F this place, I'm out of here. And they're going and they're trying to sell those credentials for profit. Either way, like whether it's nefarious or unintentional, you need to rotate those credentials and make sure that Former employees don't have access. Even insider risk is so important. If I'm at the company and I'm a developer, and let's say I'm doing a rotation into leadership now, I'm moving from an individual contributor to I'm going to start managing people and trying to make my way up to CEO someday. Like I shouldn't retain those same low level systems permissions that I had as a developer um, because I may, I'm now a target. I'm much more of a target for compromise. Um, and I just shouldn't have those permissions, right? Even at Google, like Sundar can't SSH into production, right? We have specific people who can do that. Um, and 
as an organization grows, especially as you evolve from like a startup to a mid-sized company to an enterprise, you often find there's a few people who have all the keys to the kingdom. And we need to restrict that as quickly as possible. Yeah, I think, and it's a good point. I think we need to evolve beyond the human identity side of logging and going to your email and accessing docs and realize that applications need personalities and security boundaries and, and, and applications, you know, don't break down when things are automated. Um, it's, a, it's a real thing. And I, I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that it's always hard to find money in business case to go remediate the past, right? Until a breach happens or something. And the nice part is, is a lot of these large customers we're working with are, are moving to Kubernetes, they're replatforming. So it is a bit of a greenfield opportunity. And if we bring up, hey, it'd be a lot better now if we implement something like Vault or um, Google uh, Secret Management right out of the gate, then we start from a solid foundation rather than always having to add like a, a sprint later. Um, and then it also helps us budget up front. So we can budget for these things. And it's it's always a little difficult to help people quantify the the required investment to be safe until something has kind of happened. Um, but I always say it's a lot more expensive to kind of fix something after the fact than it is to kind of get it off to a, a solid start. Um, so we'll uh, we'll keep uh, we'll keep telling the story. I think your points are super solid, and advocacy I think is really important. Is just to share what other people are doing, share best practices, um, be bold, call call customers out. Like I think your question of can you rotate all your application secrets right now because something you know a rogue official or an employee? If you can't say yes to that, hopefully you at least have a project in flight or being planned that you can kind of remediate some of these things. And, and there's like another aspect to it, which is cultural as well, um, that, that we don't talk about frequently, which is, you know, hey, if if um, you're building applications and services that regularly rotate their credentials, and if you're regularly rotating your secrets and your keys, then you're forcing your downstream consumers to handle those rotation events. All too often, you know, I go and talk to enterprise customers and they're like, you know, all of this sounds great, except none of our Java applications know how to reload their config and it takes them five minutes to boot because we're using you know, custom crazy JVM parameters. And if from the beginning we had architected that application in a way that it could receive some signal like SigHub or USR1 or something, and then it knew to go back to the palm file and reload its config without rebooting the entire JVM, we could avoid this potential downtime and we could still rotate secrets safely. Um, and this is why like, Applications shouldn't have to receive any notice or any warning that a secret is about to rotate. They should receive a notification that the secret rotated and they should know to reload a config either from a file or an environment variable or, or, or you know, somewhere to receive that new secret and begin servicing requests using it. And if we don't have that culture from the beginning, people will build libraries and, and critical system components that make the assumption that a secret is a static piece of data for the lifetime of the process. And the sooner that we get people to break that mental model, the better better off we'll be. Yeah, you, I agree. Do you see in that space, though, any standards emerging? So if we look at the platform itself as providing avenues for that, right? We think about config map reloads and things like that, or, or you know, we use Vault to dynamically reload it. I haven't seen any standard where somebody says, here's, the, here's a simple way for you to implement this. And all what we do see is a bunch of sidecar reloaders right now. They're generally very specific to Prometheus or, or some other application. Mm -hmm. Is there something you've seen in that space where like work is going on there? Yes and no. So this is something I'm actually working on um, is like defining a rotation standard. Um, mm -hmm. And the answer I've come up with is um, there is no standard. Um, and, and the reason for that is like, if I were to ask you, how do you rotate a Postgres credential? You might say, oh, well, you know, connect to Postgres, hand waving, right? Alter user, set password, whatever. Um, but what if I told you that existing connections using that old Postgres password continue to be valid for the lifetime of their existence? So you haven't really rotated the credential, have you, right? You've, you've made it so new connections require the new credential, but existing connections are still authenticated and you can continue to keep that connection alive for whatever configuration. So as a business, right, this isn't a technology decision, but as a business, what does rotating a Postgres credential mean to you? And this is where I believe, and especially after having lots of conversations with lots of customers, we can have some prefabricated rotation stories, but at the end of the day, customers are going to need to write some code or write some logic that says, this is how I want to do rotation for my business. And this is the risks that I'm willing to take 
and the caches that I'm willing to invalidate um, in order to make that rotation a reality. And I think that's why we see very specific Prometheus side code loaders, right? Like the vault console template integration. Like ultimately, like I wrote console template. It was the very first Go thing I ever wrote. It's designed to send a signal because mm. that's the only thing, like that's the minimum viable product that we know exists across Windows and Linux is like, you can get a signal. And at that point, you get to decide what to do with that signal. You could choose to ignore it. You could choose mm. to say, wait five minutes and then reload my config. But ultimately, like, what I'm seeing from my experience at HashiCorp and in talking to customers about rotation at Google is like the, the standard is that there is no standard and trying to enforce a standard is unlikely to satisfy even a majority of, of customer requirements. So when, go ahead, Jay. I'm just, I'm just curious, even at, even if at a technology level or a platform level, we're looking at technology that helps enable that. So like, we work with the business to define the standard, but there's some interface in that's common or more common to applications as they start to develop that. I guess what I see on the other side and, and culturally, if you look at old SIM solutions, right? We talked a little bit before about like this ingest of tons of money being spent on security, very little money being spent on actual response, right? Or even looking at the thing. And so I'm wondering how many customers are saying you know, to you like, Cool, I get that it has to be custom for my business, but that seems like a lot of work and it's too hard and I don't want to invest the money in it. You know and, I mean? <clears throat> totally. Um, and this is where, I don't know if you've seen some of the recent like SRE messaging that's coming out of Google, but the third book that we published in the SRE book series is actually uh, about security. It's called Building Secure and Reliable Systems. Um, shameless plug, it's totally free. You can go to google.com slash SRE and download it. Chapter eight is the best. Um, I don't know the author, but great. Um, <laughs> But no, like the entire book is amazing because we talk about security as an engineering principle. And this is something that traditional enterprises do struggle with. They think of security as traditional IT security. At Google, we think of security as an engineering practice the same way we think of reliability as an engineering practice. Again, different from how some enterprises think about IT as kind of the traditional operations role. Um, we, we believe that security, much like reliability, is an engineering role um, that requires like software engineering principles. Now that doesn't mean you need to go to like a four-year college and have some rigorous degree, but it does mean that it is an engineering job and you are not just responsible for security of the organization or the application, but you're responsible for building security tools that make it easier for other teams to do security correctly. And this was a big thing that I pushed at Vault, like with Vault when I was at HashiCorp, which was Vault is kind of like security as a service. As a security team, I define policy where I say like, these are the keys and the algorithms that you're allowed to use for encryption and you go use the transit backend and like you make an HTTP call. Because as a developer, even if you don't know anything about security, you should be able to make an HTTP call and I'll do the security for you as the administrator configuring vault. You know, at Google, we have a very similar like set of internal tools where if I want to do crypto, I use Tink. It's an open source tool, um, but we use it internally at Google and it has codified or captured as code the best practices from like our security czars, the people who like live and breathe TLS and crypto all day. But as a developer, I don't have to think about that. I just get to choose between these like five or six cipher suites and I do the thing that's best for me. And that's the model that organizations, I believe need to move towards is having a central security team that is not a gatekeeper, right? Security is not where dreams go to die. That's legal, legal is where dreams go to die. Security is where uh, we work together to understand how we deliver the most value to our customers while still being secure and maintaining a strong security posture. Um, and even at Google, like security is not a yes or no factory. It's a design partner. Um, they come in very early on and they review designs before any lines of code are written. Things like security scanning and vulnerability scanning and like OWASP top 10 stuff, all of that's automated. Like we don't pay people to do that because we have tools that do that. We pay people to think about crazy attacks and like fundamental architecture design flaws that might exist in the system that could, you know, leverage, uh, get an attacker to leverage some type of attack. Cool. Yeah. The only thing I would add to that is the only challenge we have with like the no standard is people are looking for opinions. Right. Um, but I think at the same time, it will be nice to see, you know, Shay, you kind of showed NIST standard and we talk about PCI and some of the things and sometimes like rotation doesn't come into those standards. It's more like, how have you hardened your system? And I think as we get, you know, more modern with these automated approaches, we need to have hard set rules for customers that you thou shall 
rotate your keys at least this much if you're in a PCI environment or if you're in a HIPAA environment or something else. And providing some guidelines maybe will push push things along because they're not going to get through the audit, right? And a lot of people are like, let's just get through the audit and move on to the next thing. Yeah, I've got a couple of customers. Just to quickly add to that point, Kyle, when we're talking about the next platform, we're turning off Kubernetes secrets altogether, mm -hmm. right? So that the policy and the tool and everything else is actually handled from another team and developers don't have to think about it. They're given sidecar injectors and they're, and they're given a pattern and off they go. Yeah, the one of my other initiatives is to make Kubernetes secrets pluggable for, I mean, for the reason I'm a huge opponent of Kubernetes secrets. Um, you know, there's some things that you can do to make them better application layer encryption, et cetera. But like at the end of the day, they're not versioned, they're not audited. Um, there, there's just a number of things that are wrong with them that um, we could improve, but I don't think Kubernetes should be a secret manager. And I think we should really be making sure that customers can choose whether they want to use some cloud provided secret manager or a vault or a cyber arc or their own homegrown secrets management solution. Like it should be pluggable the same way all of the other components are pluggable. Um, you know, one thing I did want to add on like the, the rotation side of things is, um, you know, you'd mentioned enforcing rotation. Um, and this is something we hear from customers a lot. And it's the whole existence of org policy on GCP is you know, we have a small startup and in general, with some exceptions, everyone gets root for like the first year of a startup because you don't like, everyone has the same title. You're like CEO or developer, like that's it. Um, and, or founder or developer and that's it. And, you know, over time those roles evolve and we gradually move to principle of least privilege. But um, if you're an enterprise, you tend to have these like very strict requirements. Maybe they're coming from a regulating body or maybe they're just, you've messed up too many times and you don't want to do it again. And this is why, you know, on Google Cloud, you can enforce these policies with org policies, um, but you don't have to. And the default, for better or worse, is often um, you can do whatever you want. There aren't any restrictions. And then you move towards a world in which you gradually add these organizational policies, which say, you know, hey, this key needs to rotate every 30 days. Or, you know, in the future, this secret will need to rotate every 30 days. Or, um, you know egress is only allowed to these particular domains. Um, and that's also kind of the journey we see customers taking as well is like, as they're moving on their cloud security journey, they're oftentimes like lift and shift as quickly as possible, right? And then migrate our security story from what we were doing on-prem to a cloud native security story. Love it. Um, so we got about five minutes left with Seth. Any of the any other questions? I don't want to dominate the conversation. Um, feel free to shout them out, guys. Um, the one thing I guess maybe to, to lead into is what do you see the the role of the developer responsibility and in, in that you know wall of confusion between sometimes development and operations? To me, it seems like the responsibility of security and you think of you talk about SRE role and owning your application is is you know it's been a cloudy kind of way for customers because they haven't defined these groups to a certain extent and we seem to be getting closer with some of the tools like you saw acm is we can set policy inside of that the security i think one of the things you just said security at google is not a yes no factory it's a design partner so the security starts to build policy that can be enforced rather than it being a pdf that has to be enforced that nobody reads do you do you see the like advice for you know younger developers coming up I want to kind of target them more than, hey, I've been developer for 25 years. This is the way we do Java development. What, what's your advice to younger developers that come up? What to focus on? It's not just uh, learn how to code anymore. It's like learn architecture, learn cloud architecture, understand security. Like I think that is probably one advice. But to the younger kind of developer, what's your advice to them as far as being well-rounded and thinking about the things that are important? <clears throat> the hardest problem in computer science is people. Um, Tech's I, easy. Uh, like tech is easy, languages are easy, you know. I and I I made this mistake, so I'll, I'll you know do as I say, not as I did. Um, don't focus so much on the languages or the patterns or the paradigms, right? Like object oriented and functional programming, Elixir versus Ruby versus Java versus COBOL. Like we often center ourselves and create our identity as as younger developers around like a language or a paradigm, um, and. I can tell you having been a developer for 12 plus years now, like none of that matters. Um, I started my career uh, doing lots of JavaScript stuff, went to Ruby, jumped back and did Node.js server side stuff, um, did Rust for a little bit, worked with Crystal, and now I primarily do Go. Um, and all of those are 
you know, object oriented functional paradigm. Like it, it doesn't matter. Um, I've done front end, I've done back end. People are the hardest problem. How do you collaborate? How do you communicate? Um, can you effectively use source control? Right. I did my undergrad at Carnegie Mellon, which is, you know, quote unquote elite university. There's a banner behind me and everything. Um, and not once in my undergraduate career on the CS department did we use Git. Um, right. There's heavy focus on algorithms and graphs and you know, that's important. And I do use graph theory on a regular basis. I know some developers don't, but I do. And I, I find that educational, but you know what I use more often than graph theory? Git. I run Git commands hundreds and thousands of times per day. And no one ever taught me about Git, right? No one ever taught me how to write effective commit messages and how to, how do I do bisect? Like the day that my colleague showed me Git bisect was like the most amazing point in my career. And that's my challenge to younger developers is what tools and technologies are going to enable you to better collaborate with your peers because software and good software is not built in a silo. Um, very, like very infrequently does like one developer build this amazing thing that the whole world latches onto. And if that happens, right, like that happened with Vagrant, right? Like Mitchell built Vagrant and the whole world latched onto it. But then very quickly, external contributors like myself and John Bender jumped in. Redis, right? Like anti-res built Redis, but then very quickly you have external contributors. Software is not built in a vacuum. And any courses that you can take, especially if you're still undergrad, that can help you collaborate better with other people, the better off you'll be. Um, because software is ultimately about people. The, the code is a byproduct of the collaboration. And if you learn how to collaborate with people, things like architecture and design will come naturally. Um, but if you live in a vacuum where, you know, this is the thing and this is how I'm going to build it and I'm not good at receiving external feedback, you're not going to really grow in your career. Nice, man. I love it. And we're on perfect timing to get you to, I'm sure, your uh, next customer meeting. So I want to thank you for jumping on, man. I think those are some great insights. And, um, you know, I, I love opinions. I think it's great that we get to work with tech and develop them because people want to hear them. Doesn't mean they're always right, but it drives future conversation and makes us kind of make better systems. So look forward to collaborating with you, man. I know we've been chatting with a few larger customers and trying to get them to drink all this uh, security Kool-Aid. So we're going to keep it up. And uh, thanks for what you do for the community, sharing knowledge and and um, the, some of the tools you've built, man, these things are like, you know, industry changing stuff. And it's really finally coming to bear that these are, are critically important to the enterprise instead of uh, startups and people twinkling in their basement. So good <laughs> on you, man. And uh, really appreciate you coming on. So um, I guess with that, guys, we're going to make it a wrap. So awesome. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks for joining. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. All right, guys. Thank you. Um, so that was uh, another wrap, another fun event today. Um, I think uh, the last one we did, we did a, a closing round. Uh, so yeah, what do you, any advice to our uh, our esteemed community from today? Anything you, you found instrumental in what Seth said? And by the way, great job with the demos. The demo gods were good again today. So thank you. Thank you, demo gods. It, I, I want to reflect on what he said, right? Like the security as a design partner, I think is an important thing for organizations to look at. And we're seeing customers doing it and participating in it. Um, it, it's actually fun to incorporate the security design and, and, and can be, and certainly causes a lot less friction down the road when you try to deploy something. So, um, you know, the way he said that, I think is, is great for people to consider. I mean, that's pretty much a t-shirt now, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, that's a great, great, a great kind of t-shirt to hand, make some friends with some security teams. It went mm -hmm. back when we can go on site again. Right guys. So uh, what about you, Paul? Any, any closing remark? We'll do a round table. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that uh, I just like to sort of highlight the the power of like some of the some of the ACM and, and GitLab stuff about multi cluster config. Like, I mean, when I you know back back in my yesteryear when I was configuring multiple multiple machines and stuff, it was always like a on a, you know a single kind of thing. You weren't doing them to all, and that's that that kind of stuff now where you just basically have a repository. You make your changes specific to whatever you're actually putting then deploy them and it goes out and deploys on everything kind of all at once is just like a really powerful um great way to 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 make sure that your your configuration is is like standardized and and deployed all at once really quickly and i think that uh yeah i learned a lot doing this uh doing this stuff so it was it was it was really fun yeah and always test in lower environments because with great automation becomes great possibilities to screw things up but yeah. 
that's don't... where Brandt rollback comes in handy. Yes, in fact, <laughs> and and also, yeah, in my my bad, I was just a demo, but all those posts, all those um, all those commits were to master, not a branch. So, <laughs> so yeah, don't do that. They got to be quick. Demos. At least you put a commit message. So you beat my ASDF, JK. Yeah, and... yeah, I don't, I don't do that. But... <laughs> awesome. And Merrick, I, I, I mean, I got to assume you got one more story to end us off. A story time with Merrick is probably going to be a new weekly uh, thing at Arctic. Yeah, so I really like the security as a design partner. Um, involved in another project right now where this is exactly what is happening. It's it's a conversation to have with security, and they try to understand how a product or a solution works. And it's it's also for them. It's not about just saying yes or no to stuff, but understanding what are the restrictions and limitations, and what can we set or define right from the get go. And I also like to pull on the people thread. So. Now that we've replaced dozens, hundreds, thousands of systems with VMs or containers, hopefully, um, that's the point. Like now we have thousands of YAML files and it's, it's really about people. So people really have to understand Git and they also have to understand complex, long YAML files and yeah, to just facilitate that, help each other out, teach each other and uh, show the tricks under the hood. Love it. Love it, man. All right, guys. So another bang out event. Um, we're going to keep these going. I think the next one is August 12th. We're going to change up the topics a little bit. We've done four uh, very Anthos focused topics. And, and I think they were all driven from this. You know, I really liked how Seth, Seth ended on the advice is like learn Git. We, it's almost becoming this novelty we talk about around you know, GitOps, and it, it, I mean, we've been talking about it so long, it's starting to feel like it's like long in the tooth, but there's so much there as far as unpacking the, the benefits of that. And I think maybe we need to spend some more time talking about the byproducts of these new ways of thinking more than the tech side. Um, so I guess that's a challenge to us in our conversations with people, because I think sometimes we get stuck in, we do this all the time. So we kind of, be, it becomes second nature and there's still an education process, not just around the tech, but around the why. What should, what's it benefit you? How does it benefit your organization? How to make your life easier? Um, and change is never easy. So, you know, it is what it is. You got to put the time in and, and you got to collaborate with your teammates and customers and everything else. So, so with that, um, I'm super jacked that we've got these awesome uh, guests into these. Like we've got some fantastic ones and some, some great things that, that I learned from these conversations. So with that, we're going to put a wrap on this one. We will post the the repost um, very soon. If uh, if you want to make sure you don't miss out on these, like and subscribe our channel. Just sign up for the newsletter, um, but keep an eye, you know, on LinkedIn, Twitter. We generally put the word out that these are coming up. And um, yeah, the best way is probably tell a friend. Tell a friend to come um, and be uh, vocal. Ask us questions, and we will find you the answers. So. All right, everybody. So let's get back to our regularly scheduled day and uh, I'll, uh, I'll hit save on this and um, everybody have a good afternoon. Thanks for all the hard work, uh, team. Awesome job. Great. See you guys. Thanks, Thanks. all. Bye, everyone. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye.